we are going live on youtube okay so currently we are live on youtube uh, welcome you all for uh, an hour with an expert lecture series three over to dr Dale. so good afternoon uh, welcome everybody so uh, this is the third in series and we have a very good number of participants so far I uh, thank you listen to Dr. Deepak. I'll be introducing him later. Now, let me let me hand it over to Dr. Manoj to uh, uh, take care of the proceedings. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's start the proceeding. I'll invite uh, Dr. Raju Thomas, President, Arvind Medical Association of India, for welcome the guest. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Am I audible? Yeah. Good afternoon, one and all. At the very outset, I welcome all the dignitaries participating in this webinar from various parts of the globe. And I congratulate Mrs. Ultimate Pharmaceuticals and Ayurvedi Vrasani for joining with the Ayurveda Medical Association of India for this webinar series and our with an expert. In the present context of the pandemic COVID-19, the subjects we selected are very important. In the current situation, Ayurveda has a lot of things to deliver and a lot of people across the globe is keenly watching the Ayurveda sector. We should be able to communicate the Ayurvedic concepts, our principles and the way our system works in an acceptable manner to the scientific community as well as the common man. I think these programs will help us to go long distances. This is the third lecture in this series and uh, eminent personalities from across the globe are delivering that. Today, we have Professor Deepa Ramji from Cardiff University as our faculty. I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Deepa Ramji. I welcome Dr. Shiban Genju, Chairman, Ultimate Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Eleven, Principal, Kotak Larval College, Dr. Rishigesh Damle, Managing Director, Ultimate Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Manoj Kalur, our member, former CCIM member, and uh, Managing Director of the Ayurveda Vilasani Vaidishara are also with us. I wholeheartedly welcome the dignitaries. General Secretary of Ayurveda Medical Association of India, Dr. Saad Dinagar. Dr. V. G. Udevumar, Research Foundation Chairman. Dr. V. G. Vinod Kumar, President of AMAI. Dr. Leda Damle, Dr. Shaiju Pallakot, Medical Officer and Researcher are also present with us. I wholeheartedly welcome all of you. I once again welcome all the dignitaries participating in this webinar from various locations. Thank you. Dr. Rishigesh, let's introduce the expert. Uh, Dr. Ramji, Deepak Ramji was in our office a few uh, months back, and um, uh, if you just meet him uh, for 10 minutes, you will know the depth of uh, knowledge what he has. And uh, we are very thankful to have him here uh, giving us the lecture today. Uh, Dr. Deepak Ramji has done his BSc from Leeds University. Then he did PhD in Biochemistry uh, from University of Leeds. As of today, he is a professor of cardiovascular science, School of Biomedicine, Cardiff University. He was a lecturer and senior lecturer and reader at School of Bioscience, Cardiff University earlier till 2017. He was also a postdoctoral research associate with Professor Genova Gilberto at IRBM Rome. So uh, he is uh, basically an academic person. Uh, his research interests are basically understanding the molecular mechanisms between inflammation, uh, immunity, uh, atherosclerosis, and cardiac disorders. In 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 short, and this is what he's going to talk about today. Uh, he was awarded. He has uh, acquired grants up to 4.3 million pounds uh, for university and for various uh, projects so far. He was uh, he has published around 170 research articles. He was the principal supervisor of 23 PhDs, two M fields, and three MREs that have been uh, completed uh, so far and he still uh, guides a uh, uh, few PhDs. 
Uh, he was an expert evaluator of panel member, evaluator and panel member for Horizon panel member chair for assessment of assessment committee of IRC SCT postdoctoral fellowship scheme. So uh, he's regularly invited across the world uh, for uh, you know various talks. And the reason he had come to India was also to give us a talk in uh, uh, Mangalore. So he, he has recently published uh, several papers, and most of the papers are about inflammation and cytokines and atherosclerosis. So he'll be enlightening us about the same topic today, uh, including uh, immunomodulation. So I request uh, Dr. Deepak Ramji to uh, you know, uh, welcome you here, and it will be a pleasure to listen to you. OK, uh, thank you, uh, Rishikesh. Uh for that, that kind introduction. Uh, thank you also to uh, Manoj, Raju, and the, the organizing uh, committees. Now, can you see my slides? Sir, uh, we request you to share the slide now, Sh okay. as share content. Right, let me go back. Uh, right, uh, so that's that, okay. Right, can you see that? Yes, perfect, sir. Okay, okay. So. Uh, thank you, obviously, for that, that uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me to be giving uh, this talk, uh, uh, this webinar, uh, on what's actually a, a National Teachers' Day in India, in fact. And so before I just sort of start talking about science, I, I would like to sort of very briefly uh, talk about uh, a little bit about my educational journey in, in a couple of minutes, uh, because it is extremely interesting and full of... Uh, ups and, and downs. Uh, and it's actually been inspirational to, to several uh, younger uh, sort of researchers that actually have heard about this. Uh, and uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, if uh, irrespective of where you start from, if there's a will, uh, in fact, a way will be there and doors will open. So uh, just to actually uh, uh, tell you in the context, uh, I was born in this very small village in, in Uganda called Saroti. Uh, my father moved there from, from India when he was 10 years old. And Saroti, in fact, is a very small village. One of the attractions there was the, this uh, 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 hill, in fact, that you see a very a picnic spot. Uh, and uh, to just give you a context in terms of how small the village was, uh, around sort of the 70s, there were only 10 television uh, sets in, in the world village. So it just gives you a, a little bit of, of context. Education only went up to the age of 16. So if you wanted to go beyond that, you had to go to the, the bigger cities or elsewhere. And so that's where I started my, my primary education. And in fact, as I was reaching, in fact, the middle stage of my primary education, my two elder brothers actually were elsewhere. Uh, getting out for the uh, for the studies, uh, and uh, uh, my parents actually had th this corner shop that you see here, and there's a, there's a mango tree uh, next to this uh, corner shop. It's still there. Uh, I actually spent a lot of time playing uh, marbles and and the, the Indian game Gilly Danda uh, with with a lot of my my friends uh, uh, there. Now, of course, things changed drastically in August 1972 when the president there, Idi Amin, um, announced that all British nationals had to leave the country in 90 days. So what I found around that uh, phase from August to December is that I lost virtually all my friends in, in, in a space of, of a couple of months. Uh, we stayed on uh, because we're Ugandan citizens. And at that stage, of course, the family was split up because the elder brothers were in, in uh, either in Kampala or in another country, Tanzania, later on, in fact, moving to Canada. And uh, the reason why my, my father sort of stayed on because we're Ugandan citizens and he thought, well, we will not be affected. And that didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, one day the people from the army came along, uh, took away uh, the, the shop and a week later also the house. So within, in fact, a week we met homeless. And uh, the doctor there, in fact, the local doctor came out to rescue, to, to help out. And at that point, uh, four of the members of the family, uh, out of six, uh, four in fact, which was uh, me, uh, my sister, and my, my, my parents, uh, moved to Baroda in India, uh, where my uh, maternal grandparents were. And so I then sort of tried to continue my education in, 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 in Baroda. Uh, it wasn't really an education. 
uh, you actually sort of found me more in, in cinemas. And uh, in four years that I was in, in India, I actually sort of must have watched in excess of 500 Bollywood movies. So study, in fact, was completely uh, out of question. And uh, uh, obviously, in fact, uh, India was, was really wonderful in, in that sense. And a lot of things which I acquired in India is something which I continue in the UK as community service. I do a lot of community service in, in, uh, in, in UK. One of them, in fact, is the so-called monthly uh, Samu Pratna, and, uh, which we started in April. And uh, Lata Ben Damle, in fact, uh, who are joined us, in fact, uh, singing a couple of bhajans in our first Samu Pratna in April. Uh, in seven, late seventies, uh, moved to Leeds, and that's where I really started my education. And for the next four years, I didn't see a single Bollywood movie. And so I did my uh, completed my secondary education there. My interest was in biochemistry, and uh, uh, so my interest was in chemistry and biology. And so that was a natural route for a degree in biochemistry at Leeds University. I then stayed on in Leeds to do my PhD, and the PhD was on gene expression during development. And uh, when I finished my PhD, the climate in terms of uh, jobs in education was not that great. So I decided to move out of uh, UK. I got a, a fellowship from the Royal Society and went on to a premier uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratories in Heidelberg, where I got interested in uh, liver-specific gene expression. Uh, and this is, in fact, uh, the EMBR laboratories in, in Heidelberg. Uh, and this was uh, funded by the Royal Society Fellowship. Then I actually moved and did another research fellowship in, in Rome, in a, a, a sort of institute funded by Merck, Sharp, and Dolme. There was a liver introduction to, to uh, industrial funding. My sort of fellowship was funded by the EU. And that's where I got interested in inflammation, liver inflammation uh, during uh, various diseases. And in uh, two, 1992, I moved from Rome uh, to uh, Cardiff in, in Wales. This is Cardiff University. I started as a junior lecturer in, in biochemistry. And I've been there for 28 years, progressing from, from a lecturer to a senior lecturer, reader, and then, of course, a personal chair, which is actually a distinguished uh, uh, professorship. And so I've continued this theme on inflammation in, in Cardiff, starting with the liver. And then in the last 15 odd years, we have focused on atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis, as you all know, is an inflammatory disorder of medium and large arteries that is associated with buildup of lipids and fats in the walls of the arteries. It's a chronic inflammatory disorder. And uh, what it does uh, is, in the mild form, cause narrowing of the arteries and restricts blood flow. Uh, the clinical complications arises when so-called atherosclerotic plaques rupture and depending on the artery that is being affected, they'll give rise to cardiovascular diseases, such as myocardial infarction, heart attacks, uh, cerebrovascular accidents, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease. Now, it's clearly a major killer worldwide. Uh, in the UK, it's responsible for around 25% of all deaths, one in four deaths in the UK. That is actually reduced in the last few years, in part due to lifestyle changes, in part due to uh, pharmaceutical intervention. But still, uh, it uh, is a major economic burden, uh, costing around uh, £9 billion uh, pounds to the healthcare uh, in the UK every year. Now, of course, whilst there, as I mentioned, there's been reduction in, in, in uh, morbidity and mortality from atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease in the West, uh, there is in fact a disturbing increase in, in sort of emerging economies. And India is, of course, one example. China is another one. And globally, it accounts for around 31% of all deaths. If you look at India, uh, what you find is that whilst we don't have sort of full statistics, uh, 
what we actually can gauge from from uh, sort of uh, various uh, sort of surveys and so on that in 2016 it accounted for around 28 uh, percent of all deaths it's around 33 percent now and that's probably an underestimate uh what is uh, even more disturbing is if you look at trends from 1990s to 2010, when, the, of course, there's been the reduction in, in the West, uh, in, 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 in India, it's increased by almost 60%. And what also, in fact, is also uh, quite alarming is that the uh, uh, onset is, is early compared to the West, it's an accelerated buildup, and there's a high rate of mortality uh, particularly, in fact, in individuals who are actually in the 30s and 40s. That is actually sort of changing, in fact, over the over the time. So I've been visiting India in the last uh, uh, sort of uh, six or seven years on, on a yearly basis. And I see, in fact, the younger generation is actually becoming more active. But still, in fact, the incidence of risk factors associated with atherosclerosis, such as high levels of blood cholesterol, hypertension, and particularly diabetes, uh, is quite ripe. Uh, in the Indian population. And here, in fact, is a little bit of link with my interest in, in Bollywood. Uh, we have lost a lot of Bollywood uh, uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of stars uh, because of, of atherosclerosis and, and a heart attacks. So from the singer, we've got Mukesh, Muhammad Rafi, and, and Kishore Kumar. And then, of course, from the actors, uh, uh, several actors, uh, we know uh, Vinod Mehra is one of them. Uh, 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 Navin Nishchal. And because I'm a Gujarati, uh, my favorite one, of course, is, is Haribai or, or Sanjeev Kumar. Uh, interestingly, in fact, on Independence Day, the movie Shole uh, celebrated 45 years. Uh, and obviously, Sanjeev Kumar had the major say in that movie uh, with the final dialogue, Ye Haat Mujhe De De Gabbar. So clearly, uh, Phenomenal uh, sort of uh, stars in, in, the, in the Bollywood industry, the singers, which unfortunately uh, died prematurely because of atherosclerosis and its complications. So, what I would like to do initially is run through the, uh, the, the uh, pathogenesis of this disease because it will actually sort of uh, uh, be extremely useful with some of the data that I'll be presenting uh, later on in my talk. So the disease is initiated by various risk factors, and one of the key risk factors is accumulation of LDL cholesterol in the plasma. And this LDL will then move, in fact, uh, uh, through the walls of the uh, uh, arteries, the endothelial layer of the arteries, uh, into the subendothelial space, where under condition of oxidative stress, uh, the LDL will get modified and one common modification is oxidation of LDL, so the LDL gets oxidized. And this actually then causes what's called endothelial cell dysfunction. And what happens in endothelial cell dysfunction is that the endothelial cells of the arteries will secrete chemo-attracting cytokines uh, into, the, into the blood. Uh, these are called chemokines. And they'll also increase the expression of so-called adhesion proteins on their cell surface, which act as clues. And so the chemokines will then attract immune cells, particularly monocytes, uh, and this will attach to the adhesion proteins and then move into the subendothelial space. And so chemokine-driven monocytic migration is the second event in the pathogenesis of, of atherosclerosis. What happens is that as these uh, uh, monocytes which are recruited, they will then differentiate into macrophages. And this differentiation of monocytes into macrophages is associated with increased expression of so-called pattern recognition receptors on their cell surface. And of course, we all know that macrophages are key players in the innate immune system. And what these pattern recognition receptors recognize is signatures or patterns associated with pathogens and add in the clearance of pathogens. Unfortunately, some of these pattern recognition receptors 
so-called scavenger receptors also recognize signatures in modified or oxidized LDL. And so they'll bind to this receptor and then via receptor-mediated endocytosis and also some of the other processes, the macrophages will take up modified LDL and transform into lipid-loaded foam cells. And these lipid-loaded foam cells form the fatty streak that you see during the early stage of the disease. So macrophage uptake of modified lipoproteins and transformation into lipid-loaded foam cells is an early event in the disease. Accumulation of cholesterol is toxic to cells such as macrophages. And so what will happen is that these macrophages will die via apoptosis and necrosis and deposit their lipid into the environment to form this lipid-rich necrotic core. And the lipids, which include cholesterols, cholesterol crystals, and other lipids, will then cause a state of chronic inflammation. And this is because activation of a lot of inflammatory pathways, which are mediated by the action of cytokines. And one such pathway is activation of the inflammasome. And so what you reach here is an intermediate lesion. But because of this uh, chronic inflammation, uh, you have a, a arthroscrotic plaque that is prone to rupture. And so to counteract this as a, as a some more uh, uh, protective mechanism, the normally quiescent smooth muscle cells migrate from the media to the intima and lay an extracellular matrix which forms this plaque stabilizing fibrous scarp. So smooth muscle migration and fibrous scarp is uh, 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 an event that occurs late on uh, in atherosclerosis when you go development of atheroma. What you reach now is a situation where there's a balance, a balance in the synthesis of extracellular matrix by smooth muscle cells and the degradation of this extracellular matrix by proteases, which are produced under inflammatory condition. And during the uh, chronic inflammation, uh, you find that the synthesis of the fibr fibrous scarf is inhibited, whereas the degradation is stimulated. And so excessive degradation will cause rupture of the plaques, uh, thrombosis, and various clinical complications. Now, of course, this is the, the pathogenesis of, of, of the disease, which is quite useful for in terms of explaining uh, sort of uh, data, which we've sort of generated from, from some of our studies. Uh, it's worth also bearing in mind that COVID-19 also affects a lot of these steps as well, such as endothelial cell dysfunction, uh, inflammation via the cytokine uh, storm, and also, in fact, uh, increasing uh, platelet aggregation. aggregation. And so the uh, lethality of COVID-19 is much higher in individuals who have got relatively advanced atherosclerosis. So what we have done in the last 15 odd, odd years is developed a, a lot of assays, uh, in vitro assays that recapitulate various steps in the pathogenesis of the disease with multiple cell types, and this include uh, monocytic migration, uh, form cell formation, and metabolic perturbations that you see associated with this disease. We also develop a range of in vivo uh, preclinical model systems. Uh, this could include uh, wild type mice, uh, which are fed uh, a high fat diet, and there are some metabolic changes that you see uh, in the early stages of the disease, particularly risk factors associated with atherosclerosis. Now, wild-type mice normally don't develop atherosclerosis. So we have to use genetically modified mice. And two genetically modified mice that are commonly used are mice uh, which are uh, uh, deficient in the LDL receptor and mice which are deficient in protein E, which is an protein. And again, you have to feed this mice a high-fat diet. Now, just to actually mention uh, one point 
is that obviously the uh, cholesterol is carried, uh, uh, the bad cholesterol is carried in the blood by LDL, and the LDL receptor are involved in clearance of this, this cholesterol. Uh, and of course, Brown and Goldstein, who discovered the LDL receptor, uh, won a Nobel Prize for that. And this explains why LDL receptor deficient mice develop atherosclerosis when you feed them a high fat diet. It's worth mentioning that the LDL receptor per se is not a major contributor to atherosclerosis uh, development because the expression of the LDL receptor is under negative feedback regulation. So the more the cholesterol is taken by the LDL receptor, the less the LDL receptors are expressed on the cell surface. So they cannot be a, a huge contributor, uh, at least in fact mechanistically, to, to atherosclerosis, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the latter stage of atherosclerosis development. On the other hand, the scavenger receptors take up LDL and modified LDL in an uncontrolled manner. So they are not under negative feedback regulation. And so in our in vivo models, we have a number of readouts, uh, which includes also hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells in the bone marrow, because this have been shown to change also drastically during the pathogenesis of the disease. So here, in fact, uh, is uh, some readouts that we, we take uh, using uh, our in vivo mouse model systems, uh, where we can look at immunoprofiling and, and live protein profiling of peripheral blood. We can look at plaque burden in, in arteries. We can look at hematopoietic uh, uh, stem and progenitor cells in the bone marrow. We can do single cell RNA sequencing. We can look at uh, other organs which uh, uh, also undergo metabolic perturbations and, and com contribute to atherosclerosis, such as the liver. And also, in fact, we can uh, not only look at plaque progression, we can also look at plaque regression. So this, in fact, are uh, development of plaques in mice and then changing diet because regression of plaques and asking the question, do our agents actually cause more regression compared to a simple switch in diet from a high fat diet to a chow diet. So that leads me quite nicely to talk about current therapies and their limitations. The majority of current therapies target the high cholesterol and lipid uh, 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 sort of a dysfunction or in lipid homeostasis that is associated with this disease. And one of the gold standards uh, in terms of treatment are the statins family of, 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 of drugs. Now, statins inhibit a rate-limiting step in the biosynthesis of cholesterol, and 75% of cholesterol is made by your body, in the, in the liver mainly, and so statins will inhibit the synthesis of, of cholesterol. And they have been extremely effective in reducing mortality uh, and morbidity associated with atherosclerosis and its complications. Uh, and they have been described as blockbuster drugs. However, statin therapy is also associated with a considerable residual uh, risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, if you actually look at individuals who are on statins, 70% of those will still uh, go on and have a heart attack, and that's because of this marked residual uh, cardiovascular risk associated with statins. Not only that, there are a number of uh, risk factors associated, uh, sorry, a number of side effects associated with statins, uh, defect, uh, effects on muscle, uh, liver, and in uh, younger individuals, uh, uh, onset of diabetes. So because of these limitations, we need to look at other avenues for uh, lowering the burden of atherosclerosis and its complications, and there have been some successes. So for example, this uh, 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 agent azitimib targets the 25% cholesterol that's of dietary origin and inhibits absorption of cholesterol uh, at the intestinal level. Uh, one particular emerging target uh, is this protease PCSK9. 
Now, what happens is that when the LDL receptors uh, bind to LDL particles, uh, they undergo uh, endocytosis. And in the lysosomes, the uh, LDL is, 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 is degraded to uh, give rise to cholesterol. And the receptors are then actually uh, recycled back to the cell surface. What PCSK9 does, it causes modification of the LDL receptors. So instead of being recycled, it, the receptor undergoes uh, a lysosomal degradation, thereby lowering the LDL receptor levels on the cell surface. And so uh, one sort of emerging therapy in the last few years has been monoclonal antibodies against PCSK9 that prevent this modification of the LDL receptor, so they're recycled back to the cell surface. But this is actually quite expensive uh, therapies. Uh, Molecular antibodies typically cost around 8,000 American dollar per patient per year. So it has to be restricted to those who are extremely high risk. And of course, this will uh, not work in, in obviously countries like, like, like India, where of course you have got a, a sort of a, a, a population factor, which, which is actually at more of a poor end uh, in, in, so in financially. And so if you go and look beyond this, almost a dozen pharmaceutical leads have failed at the clinical level, which has caused billion to the industry. And this is not surprising because here is a disease where agents have to be taken between 30 to 50 years in the lifespan of an individual. And it's very difficult to predict side effects unless you've got genetic evidence. And PCSK9 is one example where there's genetic evidence. Individuals who have uh, deficiency in PCSK9 don't develop atherosclerosis even if they've got high plasma cholesterol levels. Okay, so that's, that's an example of genetic evidence directing therapies. Uh, apart, uh, if you're taking an agent for 30 to 50 years, uh, which has got multiple uh, targets, clearly uh, you're going to have side effects if you're drastically lowering the action of that target. So what beyond uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, manipulating uh, lipid homeostasis, cholesterol levels. Well, of course, we all know that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disorder, and we know that inflammation is regulated by cytokines. So one particular uh, interesting target is actually sort of cytokines themselves. And indeed, you find a number of pro and inflammatory cytokines which are expressed in atherosclerotic lesions in animal models and also in humans. And what you find is that pro-inflammatory cytokines predominant, uh, uh, predominant anti-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines. So what you can think about is uh, target pro-inflammatory cytokines either by using small molecule inhibitors of the cytokines or key components of its intracellular signaling pathways. Uh, you can use neutralizing antibodies that mop up the cytokines. You can use soluble deco receptors. So these are receptors which are the solubilized form. They'll bind to the cytokine in the cytoplasm, preventing it to binding to the cell surface receptor. So deco receptors are small cytokine receptors which mop up the cytokine, preventing it from binding to the cognate cell surface receptor. And also you can think about manipulating cells, which produce, uh, uh, manipulating immune cells, which produce certain cytokines. So inhibiting those which produce pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, and stimulating those which produce anti-inflammatory cytokines. And indeed, almost, I would say, 10 to 12 years, we have worked on, on various aspects of cytokines. And what you'll find in terms of references, uh, most of them are predominantly uh, published work from, from my laboratory. Uh, now and then, in fact, there are uh, references which are outside my laboratories. So in this case, uh, Back and Hansen, in fact, is, is, is independent of, of, of work in my laboratory. So uh, this can actually act for, for further uh, reading if required. And so uh, what uh, we tried because of this attractiveness of, of, of cytokines uh, as a sort of therapeutic target, uh, try to look uh, at cytokine actions in more detail. 
But this is actually not simple. And the reason it's not simple is when you start looking at the number of cytokines and cytokine receptors involved in atherosclerosis and a lot of other diseases as well. So these are uh, chemokines, chemokine receptors, interleukins, and other cytokines uh, with uh, uh, known uh, uh, effects on atherosclerosis, and they are present in atherosclerotic plaques. Uh, it's, of course, not the uh, numbers of cytokines involved. If you look at immune cells, there's a lot of different uh, polarization states of, of various immune cells uh, creating complexity, and newer type of immune cells are being identified from more sophisticated uh, single-cell RNA sequencing approaches. So if you take, for example, macrophages, uh, there are at least uh, sort of four to eight different phenotypes, and that's increasing all the time. The same applies with other immune cells, such as T cells. And uh, in terms of the interleukins and cytokines that are shown in red uh, are some of those on which we have done uh, work in the past, trying to understand uh, their effects in more detail. It's a lot of work uh, spanning about 10 to 12 years. And I'm just going to use one example uh, of, of a cytokine that we have studied uh, and to just give you uh, the sort of feel about the scale of, of research activity required. Uh, and this is just one cytokine. If you take, in fact, the number of cytokines involved, the list, in fact, goes into hundreds. And the cytokine I'm going to uh, talk about is interleukin-33. And uh, interleukin-33 is a more recently discovered member of the interleukin-1 families. You all have heard about interleukin-1, uh, interleukin-6, and of course, Atrimed works on interleukin-6. Uh, uh, obviously, the interleukin-1 family goes up to interleukin-37, and we've got some research going on at the moment on interleukin-35. Now, uh, interleukin-33, uh, IL-33, a more recently discovered member of the family, it's got two cell surface receptors, one which is the large form of S, uh, uh, ST2 receptors. The receptor is called ST2, and ST2L is the large uh, form of the receptor, which is membrane-bound and initiates intracellular actions of the interleukin-33. There's also a small soluble ST2 receptor. So this is in the soluble form. It's a deco receptor which binds IL-33 and mops up the cytokine. And our interest in the interleukin-33 uh, ST2 receptor axis in atherosclerosis uh, uh, emerged from some studies carried out uh, that showed that uh, the soluble ST2 levels were increased uh, in myocardial infarction uh, and heart failure. And uh, there was another study that showed protective effect of interleukin-33 in experimental models of heart failure. So what carried out by our collaborator using the apolagor protein E deficient mouse model of atherosclerosis uh, went on to demonstrate that if you inject interleukin-33 into these mice, which are fed a high-fat diet, you attenuate uh, atherosclerosis. On the other hand, if you mop up interleukin-33 by injecting this soluble ST2 receptor, you exacerbate the disease. And of course, the studies then went on to identify a mechanism uh, where interleukin-33 uh, caused a change from a pro-inflammatory T helper 1 type of response to an anti-inflammatory T helper 2 type of response. And also, this mice had high level of antibodies against oxidized LDL, which were produced in an interleukin-5 dependent manner. Let me just show you a couple of pieces of data from this, this published studies. So here, in fact, is, is obviously the lumen of, of, of the, 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 uh, the, the arteries, the aortic root of these animals injected with PBS. And here, in fact, is injected with IL-33. And as you can see, uh, that the lumen, in fact, is, is much larger here. And if you look at the uh, plaque area, what you find is that interleukin-33 causes a reduction in 
the plaque area. If you look at the immune cells in the plaque, you find that there's a reduction in macrophages and T cells, and there's no change in smooth muscle cells or collagen, which is produced by the smooth muscle cells. So here is injecting interleukin-33. If you do the other experiment where you mop up interleukin-33 by uh, injecting the soluble ST2 receptor, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, sort of uh, mops up the, the, the interleukin-33, you see a reversal. The plaque area is actually uh, increased. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, it works independent of macrophage or T cell levels. But if you look at inflammatory cytokine, particularly interferon gamma, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, its levels are increased. Or if you look at an anti-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin-5, its levels are decreased. So these were quite interesting results, and we followed it up by looking at uh, macrophage form cells in the plaques of these animals, and we found that they were also reduced. We also went on to look at the mechanisms by which this reduction in form cell formation occurred, and what we found was there was a, re a decrease in uptake of modified LDL by these uh, macrophages, and there was stimulation of efflux of uh, cholesterol uh, from form cells. And so all these studies pointed of uh, IL-33 being protective in atherosclerosis, so a potentially uh, promising therapeutic target. Uh, and so when we started doing additional studies in macrophages, we also found a lot of protective effects. So it inhibited the expression of proteases, which cause uh, plaque uh, uh, rupture uh, by thinning the fibrous scalp. It uh, inhibited the expression of a lipase, slug protein lipase, uh, which is proarthrogenic in macrophages. It also inhibited pro-inflammatory genes such as chemokines and addition proteins. And so when we started looking at macrophages, wow, there were lots of protective effect. But this is one of the uh, unfortunate uh, sort of uh, uh, situation, one unfortunate uh, action associated with uh, any cytokine that you look at. Whilst there are protective effects, there are also, in fact, bad effects, detrimental effects. So in other words, we've got a double-edged sword. And so if you look at interleukin-33, uh, some actions of interleukin-33, particularly in endothelial cells, are proarthrogenic. And this actually applies to uh, this double-edged sword action applies to virtually every cytokine that you can think about. And uh, over a number of years, we have doubled and looked at the actions of, of lots of cytokines in relation to form cell formation. Of course, a critical early event in the pathogenesis of the disease. And here, in fact, is uh, lots of published uh, papers. Uh, form cell formation is actually a balance between uptake of cholesterol by, by macrophages, which is bad, and efflux of cholesterol out of macrophages, which is good. And so what we found is that if you look at pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interferon gamma, it inhibits uptake and stimulates efflux, which is really excellent. But again, interferon gamma has some protective effects. If you look at anti-inflammatory cytokines, and I presented some data on interleukin-33, Transforming growth factor beta is another one. Uh, because it's anti-inflammatory, it inhibits uptake and stimulates efflux, uh, thereby being protective, but that's in macrophages. There's a paper in Nature Medicine uh, uh, last year, which showed that in endothelial cells, TGF beta is bad. In other words, uh, it's uh, uh, proarthrogenic. So you've got this double-edged sword. And that applies to every cytokine. And so it's not surprising that when you start looking at clinical trials, which have tried to uh, manipulate cytokine levels, the results have been mixed. And I'm going to talk about two very large clinical trials that have uh, targeted inflammation. And if you're really interested in, in sort of uh, understanding this further, uh, there's a nice article by Chan and, and myself in Future Medicinal Chemistry 
uh, which was published this year. And these are extremely large trials. So one of them is for the Cantos trial, over 10,000 participants. And in this case, they looked at individuals who had previous myocardial infarction. In other words, they were already on statins, uh, but uh, they actually had a high level of inflammation as uh, shown by uh, the uh, high levels of high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And the target here was a monoclonal antibody against interleukin-1 beta, which was one of the first cytokine uh, for which work was done on atherosclerosis. Uh, three doses were injected. Uh, this targets the IL-1 beta, IL-6 pathway. And uh, what was found was that the significantly lowered cardiovascular events. So extremely uh, promising uh, findings. But uh, the individuals were more prone to infection. So that meant that you had to restrict this to high-risk individuals. And of course, there are cost implications as well, because monoclonal antibodies are expensive. Uh, to circumvent this, uh, there was another trial with around sort of eight, uh, eight, uh, sorry, 5,000 uh, participants, uh, which was based on, based on the rationale that individuals with arthritis are predisposed to atherosclerosis. And what's worked quite well in arthritis is low-dose methotrexate. So in these trials, they took individuals, uh, uh, which actually, again, had previous myocardial infarction or cardiovascular event. Uh, they gave them low-dose methotrexate as a broad-spectrum anti-inflammatory. No observed benefits were often found, and the trial was stopped last year. Uh, again, a huge cost because you're talking around 5,000 participants. And so this actually sort of brought along several uh, sort of points that we have to bear in mind. Uh, the double-edged sword, which I mentioned, uh, interleukin-1 beta, while it's proathogenic, there have been some recent studies that have shown that it also stabilizes atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that by targeting inflammation, you're going to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, make individuals more prone to infection. And also, uh, maybe targeting specific cytokines may be better than using broad-spectrum anti-inflammatory. So the net, uh, what I've tried to sort of uh, mention is that while there have been some successes in, in, in the field of uh, therapies, pharmaceutical therapies, uh, on atherosclerosis, there have been numerous failures. And one promising target, inflammation, uh, I've illustrated uh, firstly about the huge number of, uh, 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 a huge uh, number of uh, uh, studies required uh, to understand mechanisms of cytokine actions, but also the mixed results of very large clinical trials. And so that has brought a lot of interest recently on natural products. And of course, natural products have got an excellent safety profile uh, from work which has been carried out over, over numerous years. And we actually also know the protective e effects of, of natural products from very large uh, uh, studies based on, on diet and, and cardiovascular disease. For example, the Mediterranean diet has been found to be protective. So over the last five or six years, research in my laboratory has moved quite heavily uh, onto natural products. But research on nat natural products have uh, lagged that on pharmaceuticals uh, on two key aspects. One is large clinical trials. And I showed you, in fact, that the, the scale involved, you know, the Cantos trial, 8,000 participants. 5,000 participants in the third trial. So this is the scale uh, with, with, with natural products. We, we're talking in a lot of studies, which are more 50 to 100 participants, really very low scale. Uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, lack of mechanistic insight. And this lack of mechanistic insight is something which we have dabbled and then tried to understand in more detail. And uh, in 2016, we had a really nice, uh, highly cited article in Nature Reviews Cardiology, which dealt with all the natural products in cardiovascular disease at that particular time. And this is one of the figures which is taken 
from that article. And it shows you that apart from omega-3 uh, fatty acids, our understanding of natural products in, in, in terms of mechanistically uh, on uh, the protection against atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease is limited. And uh, is also worth mentioning is not just one-way traffic because studies on natural products can give rise to potent pharmaceuticals. And statin, of course, is, is one example of, of a natural product, uh, in fact, moving on to uh, more synthetic chemistry. And here, in fact, is another example. So a paper in Cell, which showed that some of the actions of omega-3 fatty acids found in fish oil were mediated by a cell surface receptor called G-protein coupled receptor 120. And then a follow-up study where a selective agonist was found uh, of a G-protein uh, coupled receptor 120 that improved insulin resistance and chronic inflammation. So in my laboratory, we have worked on pure natural products and also, in fact, as combinations. Uh, several agents have been studied, uh, polyphenols found in oli olive oils, uh, omega-3 fatty acids in fish oils, certain beneficial omega-6 fatty acids, flavanols, uh, phytosterols, and, and then probiotic organisms. And uh, obviously, because of th this, this talk is being, being recorded, uh, all my results, in fact, uh, is a summary of a published uh, uh, work from, 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 from the laboratory. Uh, we've done, of course, a lot of work which has been unpublished, and I'm happy to uh, talk, in fact, that uh, later on, in fact, in Q&A sections and also, in fact, uh, uh, via further communications later on. Uh, natural product research, of course, got a boom uh, last year by this large trial, reduce it trial, uh, of 8,000 uh, participants. And uh, the, uh, the rationale for this study was based on omega-3 fatty acids. Now, some of the earlier sort of uh, studies on omega-3 uh, fatty acid-rich diet and cardiovascular disease were successful because they actually had a, a higher baseline of intake because the population was either Mediterranean in origin or Japanese in origin. Then subsequently, using the same concentration, of course, the baseline was lower. So in fact, the overall intake was, was lower. Uh, you had lots of mixed uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 mixed outcomes. So what this was taking into account, so they used a very high uh, dose of, of uh, an ethyl ester of one of the omega-3 fatty acid EPA to mimic that found in Mediterranean uh, population and also Japanese population. And so these were individuals who were on statins, uh, had high triglyceride levels, and they were given twice daily doses of an ethyl ester form of this omega-3 fatty acid EPA. And what was found was that the uh, level of uh, cardiovascular death was reduced. And there is, in fact, an ongoing trial called an evaporate trial, where they've also seen some reduction in atherosclerosis. Of course, when you're talking about fish oils, uh, we're also talking about uh, depletion of, 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 of fish, which is, of course, an acute uh, sort of problem. We're also, in fact, looking at environmental issues. So we need to look at other polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs. And in fact, the general belief that uh, omega-6 fatty acids are bad is not universal. There are some beneficial omega-6 fatty acids, and one of them is dihomo gamma linolenic acid, which I'll call DGLA. And I'll present some, some data on that uh, uh, sort of uh, soon. And then I'll sort of present some studies on probiotics because they're actually sort of quite cheap uh, and perhaps more applicable uh, to the Indian uh, population. So here, in fact, is uh, some, some studies, in fact, on omega-6 uh, fatty acid DGLA. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there have been some previous studies that have shown that it's anti-inflammatory. And DGLA is synthesized from gamma linolenic acid, or GLA. And you find GLA in evening primrose oil uh, and borage oil, of course, which are some supplements which are taken in certain parts of the world. Now, up to recently, our understanding of uh, DGLA and atherosclerosis was, was quite limited. 
is also worth mentioning is that uh, these studies were carried out in collaboration with Ben Gurion University in Israel, where produced a mutated uh, algae that produced TGLA uh, as 20% of their dry weight. Now, what has got us interested in TGLA was some studies carried out by our collaborator using the apple protein E deficient mouse, which have uh, been fed a high fat diet along with TGLA. And what these studies found was that when you looked at the aorta, there was uh, reduced levels of lipids. There were also reduced inflammation because there were reduced level of macrophages, also reduced level of adhesion proteins, which are associated with inflammation. There was one particularly bad effect, which was there was also reduced level of smooth muscle cells among lots of good effects. But what these studies didn't indicate was mechanisms how do you uh, explain these changes that you see in the animal models uh, mechanistically at the molecular level? And this is what we went on to carry it out. So for example, our preclinical studies showed that there was reduced plaque macrophage content. And we went on to show that this was because uh, DGLA inhibited chemokine-driven monocytic migration. The uh, uh, preclinical in vivo study showed this reduced plaque inflammation. And we went on to show that DGLA inhibited pro inflammatory gene expression in macrophages by three pro uh, arthrogenic cytokines interferon gamma, interleukin 1 beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And in the case of interferon gamma, we actually pinpointed the mechanism to a single phosphorylation change in a key transcription factor called STAT1, or signal transducer and activator of transcription 1, and TGLA inhibited interferon gamma-mediated phosphorylation of this transcription factor on serine 727. And when we looked at over 80 genes, we found that those involved in inflammation, addition proteins, and also those involved in uh, lipid homeostasis were affected. We also could explain why they reduce smooth muscle cell content in, in, in the animal model systems because DGLA uh, inhibited the migration of smooth muscle cells, but also inhibited proliferation of endothelial cells. What about reduced uh, levels of uh, of plaque lipids or lipids in the aorta. And so what we did here is we took some macrophages, we incubated them with uh, acetylated LDL, which is like oxidized LDL taken up by macrophages and which converts into form cells, either in the presence of vehicle or DGLA, or in fact uh, with vehicle in the absence of uh, DGLA. And in these experiments, we actually had a 14C level acetate, so radioisotope of uh, cholesterol, uh, sorry, of, of carbon uh, uh, in, in acetate. Now, one of the hallmark of foam cells is that they have increased intracellular level of cholesterol esters. And so if you look at this highlighted area, in the presence of just acetyl LDL, you've got a massive increase in uh, the cholesterol ester level, and this is inhibited by DGLA. So DGLA inhibits macrophage foam cell formation, which then accounts for the reduced level of lipids that we see in the aorta. Now, of course, when I actually talked about cholesterol uh, and foam cell formation, I, I mentioned, in fact, it's a balance, a balance between uptake, which is part of so-called foam cholesterol transport, which is bad. So this is where macrophages can take up uh, LDL or modified LDL, either by receptor-mediated endocytosis or by other processes such as macropinocytosis or phagocytosis. And when you look at uh, DGLA and the, uh, the effects on this individual processes, we find that uh, it uh, causes inhibition. So here, in fact, is DGLA-mediated inhibition of receptor-mediated endocytosis. So we used oxidized LDL, which is fluorescently labeled. And here is DGLA-mediated inhibition 
of macropinocytosis, where we use a fluorescently labeled dye as a marker of macropinocytosis. We also went on to show by a variety of assays that DGL also inhibits the expression of scavenger receptors, which are involved in this receptor mediated endocytosis. And here are two scavenger receptors scavenger receptor A and CD36, and the expression being inhibited at both the messenger RNA and also at the protein level. So that is uptake of our cholesterol which is bad. There's also a process called efflux of cholesterol, which is good. Uh, so in this case, the cholesterol from foam cells is picked up by HDL, high-density lipoprotein, which is, of course, a good cholesterol carried by your body. The HDL will then take it to the liver, and the liver, the uh, cholesterol will be converted into bile. And we know from, from our uh, sort of school days, uh, lessons on effect on, on digestion, uh, that bile emulsifies fats and reduces uh, their surface area for the action of lipases. And indeed, that's one of the job of, 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 of bile uh, produced by the liver, uh, and of course, then secret, uh, stored in obviously the, the gallbladder and secreted, in fact, during the digestion process. 95% of this bile is absorbed back, 5% you get rid from the body, and this is the root, the only root by which the body can get rid of cholesterol. That's why this reverse cholesterol transport and cholesterol efflux is a good process. And when you look at DGLA in macrophages, it stimulates cholesterol efflux. So DGLA is synthesized from GLA. And GLA, as I mentioned, is found in evening primrose oil and borage oil. So it's not surprising that G uh, GLA is also uh, anti-arthrogenic, and here are some uh, sort of data. Uh, it inhibits interferon gamma-induced pro-inflammatory gene expression and also chemokine-driven uh, monocytic migration. GLA is not as, 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 as potent as DGLA in its action. So the next question we ask is that that's fine. What are the intracellular mediators of DGLA actions? What happens once DGL is taken by the cells? What does it get metabolized? And what are, uh, uh, which uh, uh, metabolites carry out the actions of DGLA? So here we went on and carried out what was called a mass spectrometric uh, based approach. And we found that the levels of one of the icosanoid prostaglandin E1 was increased uh, by DGLA under inflammatory conditions when you interfere gamma or in the non-inflammatory condition, just DGLA, a massive increase. And uh, this correlated uh, with uh, uh, actions of DGLA also being media, also seen when you use PGE1. So instead of DGLA, if you add PGE1 to macrophages, prostaglandin E1, you see similar uh, responses, such as interferon gamma-induced pro-inflammatory gene expression and chemokine-driven monocytic migration. You can also knock down the expression of enzymes which are involved in the formation of prostaglandin E1. And the enzymes uh, involved are cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. And you can knock down the expression of cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 using small interfering RNA. And this is what we have done here. Here we are looking at interferon gamma induced expression of this MCP1. If you look at our negative control, DGLA still inhibits this induction. So you see this reduction by DGLA. However, if you knock down the expression of cyclooxygenase 1 and 2, uh, and thereby the production of prostaglandin E1, you uh, no longer see this reduction. So that actually sort of goes on to point uh, that PGE1 is a mediator, central mediator of the actions of DGLA. And you actually sort of carried out a lot of other work, which, which I'm not going to talk today. This is, of course, uh, unpublished work. Now, the last story that I'm going to uh, tell you about, and again, what I'm going to talk about is uh, published work. Uh, we've also done a lot of unpublished work, which is actually being written up at the moment. Uh, this is something of obviously interest in India. Uh, it actually sort of came about in part of this study published in Nature on septis, uh, sepsis uh, in, a, in a sort of... Uh, uh, a, sim, uh, a, tr a trial in rural India, 
uh, where there was a, a randomized uh, uh, symbiotic trial which prevented sepsis. And one of the key agent here was Lactobacillus plantarum. And of course, Lactobacillus plantarum is a probiotic bacteria. And of course, probiotics are relatively cheap. And so that brought us an interest in, in potential probiotic as, as anti-arthrogenic uh, uh, preventatives and also potentially being used as, as, as therapeutics with pharmaceutical agents. And we all know that the gut microbiota plays a key role uh, in the uh, uh, various pathologies, including atherosclerosis. So if uh, an individual has got a diet which is rich in red meat, then you've got high levels of phosphatidylcholine and L-carnitine, which the gut microbiota will convert into trimethylamine. The trimethylamine will then be converted into trimethylamine uh, oxide, which then mediates uh, proarthrogenic effects, such as it reduces reverse cholesterol transport and stimulates forward cholesterol transport, thereby causing uh, atherosclerosis. And probiotics have got many beneficial effects in relation to atherosclerosis. And uh, here's a, a diagram taken from one of our articles uh, recently published in Molecular Nutrition and Food Research that shows you the beneficial effects of probiotic bacteria. And again, I would highly recommend to, that you read this if you're interested in probiotics. So <clears throat> the research, in fact, in probiotics came along because of a collaboration with a, with a lot, local probiotic company called Caltech Limited. Uh, our sort of previous collaborative study has shown that uh, uh, a lactobacillus plantarum cul-66, uh, a probiotic bacteria, cause lowering of cholesterol in uh, the CACO2 enterocyte uh, cell culture model system. Uh, some other published studies uh, by the, the company also showed that a so-called lab for consortium of probiotic, which contained two species of lactobacillus acidophilus and two species of uh, bifidobacterium uh, bifidum also had some anti-inflammatory activities. So the question we asked was that what when you combine uh, the two probiotic mixture uh, and look at its effect? And the, the study which I'm going to describe uh, only looks at uh, the uh, sort of risk factors associated with atherosclerosis in mice which have been fed a high-fat diet for a short-term duration. We, of course, went along and have done uh, studies on atherosclerosis, which are unpublished. And also the company has done uh, some uh, trial on 400 individuals where they've shown some uh, successes with some of the parameters that we've also seen in our preclinical studies that I'm going to present in a minute. So this is our experimental design. Uh, 18 wild-type mice, six were fed a chow diet for, for two weeks. Uh, this was our baseline. The other 12 were split into two groups. Six fed a high fat diet uh, containing uh, uh, cholesterol uh, with no probiotics. And the other six fed a high fat diet with probiotics. And then we looked at a number of parameters, lipids in the plasma, cytokines, and we also looked at uh, metabolites in, in tissues and also looked at gene expression. So here are some summaries. First of all, if you look at weight gain, a high-fat diet, what you find is that the probiotic significantly inhibits this in this model system. And of course, the companies went on to show that this also occurs in uh, 400 participants in an article published uh, in scientific reports uh, last year. If you look at uh, plasma lipids, so this is total cholesterol, VLDL, LDL cholesterol, and HDL cholesterol, and they've got triglycerides. Compared to baseline, high fat diet causes an increase in total cholesterol, VLDL, LDL cholesterol, and also HDL cholesterol. If you look at probiotics, there's a significant reduction in total cholesterol and also significant reduction in LDL, VLDL cholesterol. There's no change on inflammation markers. 
So the next question is that what is responsible for this reduction in total and LDL, VLDL cholesterol that we see in these animals? As I mentioned, is that the only way the body can get rid of cholesterol is via the bile system, uh, which we use about 5% of bile. Uh, and this is the pathway involved. So cholesterol is converted into bile uh, by this red limiting enzyme, uh, which is called, which is abbreviated as CYP7A1. So that's the red limiting enzyme in the biosynthesis of cholesterol, sorry, biosynthesis of bile uh, in the liver. So cholesterol into bile, the red limiting enzyme is the CYP7A1. So we looked at the bile uh, levels in the plasma and also in the fecal uh, and the feces of, of this, these animals uh, by uh, a sort of mass spectrometry based approaches. Here we've got a principal component analysis. Here we've got heat maps. And as a summary, if you look at the plasma, there was actually uh, uh, no change in, in bile acid. But if you look at the, uh, the uh, fecal material, uh, you found that there was significantly increased bile levels. So, uh, so there was uh, increased uh, excretion of, of bile. And this you saw uh, it when you looked at total or unconjugated bile acid, they were always significantly higher in the probiotic group. You can also look at individual uh, bile uh, acids in, in, the, in, the uh, in the feces of these this animals. Again, increased levels of uh, individual bile acids or uh, also deoxycholic acid, uh, higher deoxycholic acid. So there was increased bile, which was got rid from the body in, in the feces. So how could we explain this? What are the mechanisms involved? So for this, we started looking at uh, gene expression. We looked at gene expression in the liver. We looked at gene expression uh, in the intestine. And what we found was that uh, there was changes in gene expression in relation to bile acid metabolism. And so if you look at the red limiting enzyme in the synthesis of bile in the liver, uh, CYP7A1 or cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase, its expression was increased. So that means there was small bile being produced by the probiotics in the liver of the animals. So this is a, a red limiting enzyme involved in the synthesis of bile. There's also an inhibitor of the transcription of this enzyme. And this inhibitor is uh, called a small heterodimer partner with a transcriptional repressor of CYP7A1. And consistent with the inhibitory uh, effect of this on CYP7A1, we found that its level were reduced in the liver of animals which are fed probiotic compared to just high fat diet. So we could pinpoint the mechanisms for the changes that we saw in the plasma uh, uh, cholesterol levels, which was increased bile synthesis uh, in the liver because of changes in the expression of key red limiting enzymes uh, and also transcription factors, uh, which are involved in the production of bile and the very increased excretion of the bile from the body. So, I hope, in fact, I've given you a flavor uh, by these two studies uh, that uh, atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disorder where cytokines play a key role in all stages of the disease. Uh, current therapies I've talked about, statins, azetime, PCSK9 inhibitors. I've also, in fact, uh, uh, talked about cytokine therapeutics and, and, and the mixed result. But one point to bear in mind is that the current therapies, so the statins are associated with residual cardiovascular risk together with various effects. And so we need to look at alternatives. While in alternatives, we've got some successes. There have been lots and lots of failures. And the failures goes, in fact, into dozens. So we need to now look at natural products. But we need, in fact, in terms of natural products, deeper mechanistic insight and large clinical trials. And so I've gone on to show you that at least with two agents that we are studying, the omega-6 fatty acid DGLA and probiotics, uh, we actually know 
uh, that they inhibit several proautogenic processes in vitro and in vivo. We also, in fact, inform the mechanisms which are underlying the beneficial actions of DGLN probiotics. And in, in some cases, the probiotics, in fact, is moved in fact to, to humans as well. And my final slide, of course, is acknowledging uh, uh, our funders, British Heart Foundation. They've funded my research for over 20 years. Uh, also, the local probiotic company Caltech Limited, uh, Ben Gurion University in Israel. Here, in fact, is a list of my collaborators. And here, of course, some of the people who have carried out the work. So the DGLA work was predominantly by Heli Kalaha, a PhD student in the laboratory. And then, of course, some of the work has been taken to the next stage by uh, Jessica Williams, Ala Ismail, and Yu Hong Chang. Uh, I had no time to talk about their work. Uh, uh, Yi Chang has also worked on other uh, sort of natural products as well. And the probiotic studies were carried out uh, by a PhD student, Victoria Morian. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for, for listening. Uh, hope, in fact, I'll give you a flavor about the field of atherosclerosis, uh, targets, and also the huge potential that natural products have in the prevention and treatment of this disease. Thank you, and I'll stop there. And I also, in fact, uh, uh, stop sharing my, my slides. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can keep the slides on because uh, maybe okay. that we will. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Back. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, Bharat, uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, it was really a very informative talk, and uh, I would like to take a couple of questions from audience side. Uh, yeah. Very first question I would like to take is uh, regarding the animal model being used uh, in the atherosclerosis study. A question goes like this. Majority of drugs, including statins, are developed using only one genetic model, that is C57 mice and used by all peop uh, people across the world. Is it could be the reason for major unwanted effects caused by these statins? Well, I think there, there are two things here, right? Is translation of animal model studies into, into humans, okay? And that, of course, is, is a major hurdle, right? So C57 BL6 mice, right? is actually not a model for atherosclerosis because even if you've kept feeding these mice a high fat diet they're not going to develop much much atherosclerotic but this is a good mo model for looking at look, looking at uh, metabolic perturbations right uh, metabolic syndrome and risk factors associated with the disease uh, you need to go into obviously uh, the, the two mouse models that i described the LDR receptor deficient mouse model and their protein E deficient mouse model, which have to be fed a high fat diet. Uh, again, of course, each model has got their limitation. And of course, in some countries, uh, piece, uh, the rabbits have been sort of utilized as well, and non human primates. Uh, clearly, one has to actually be cautious in terms of uh, extrapolating because uh, animal models are different from, from humans. In fact, in a lot of uh, aspects, I mean, two key aspects is. Uh, lipid homeostasis. So mice carry HDL as their cholesterol. Humans, in fact, carry cholesterol as LDL particles. And of course, there are differences in the immune system between, between mice men, and humans as well. So that is one of the hurdle. Then, of course, the other point to bear in, so, you know, we are trying to develop new model systems. So one particular model system is using wild-type mice. So there's no genetic defi deficiency but you actually inject into them an adeno-associated virus against this Proteus PCSK9 that I mentioned. So this is actually away from the genetic background. But again, that model has got uh, sort of various limitations. So that's one thing to bear in mind. But, you know, we have to start at some point. And if you look at statins, the, the work on statins originally was actually carried out in cells. And it was even not even, in fact, uh, a human cell. They were carried out in yeast cells. Uh, looking at cholesterol uh, sort of metabolism in yeast cells, then it related to human cells, then of course animal uh, models. And then of course eventually you need large human trials. What bearing in mind that we've got a very heterogeneous worldwide population that's not often reflected in, in sort of clinical trials. 
So what you actually find in a large clinical trial on Caucasians uh, will not be applicable to say, the Indian population. So that's why, in fact, you have got these issues, in fact, where a tried and trusted uh, sort of agent in one clinical trial will actually produce various sort of uh, issues. And one of the things when, of course, starting was extremely successful was people thought, well, let's give them to a younger population. And they found that it caused uh, sort of diabetes. And that's because HMG coi reductase and cholesterol is quite a, an essential component, right? Cholesterol is required for membranes, is required for uh, sort of brain physiology and so on. So you need to be careful about, you know, prescribing this, in fact, uh, on, on a universal basis. So that's why I think you have some, some mixed, uh, mixed sort of uh, uh, sort of results. So I wouldn't say, in fact, you know, that is, uh, I know, in fact, that uh, wild type mice are used universally. I don't think, in fact, that that's the reason for, for the issues, Sid, with, 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 with starting another pharmaceuticals. Uh, mice, of course, are useful animal models because of the genetics. Uh, but uh, in terms of identifying agents, we need to actually sort of carry out clinical trials. And that clinical trials, in fact, has to be multinational and take the wolf heterogeneity in, in the various population into account to actually get a full effect. So I've, in fact, uh, in a sort of more rounded manner, I've sort of tried to describe sort of quite key limitations that we have. But in we are moving somewhere in terms of uh, uh, but, you know, we need to have more clinical trials. And, of course, uh, in one yeah. of countries like India. Okay. Have I? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. I feel uh, the question is very well answered. And I would like to take the next question. And it is regarding, uh, there is a lot of data available on preclinical uh, investigation of herbs and uh, natural products on atherosclerosis uh, and its validation and we, we, how we can evaluate it based on the personalized intervention in clinical trials. One thing is, is worth bearing in mind, right, that diet obviously dietary components, right, when you start giving it to individuals, you have to be extremely careful uh, if individuals are taking pharmaceuticals. And uh, so sometimes, you know, I'm going to watching, in fact, uh, sort of various media things, you know, and sort of uh, channels about, about herbal sort of therapies, in fact, and, and so on and so forth, you know. If it's actually taken in the wrong way, in fact, it can cause uh, sort of more harm. And let me just give you one example, right? Uh, grapefruit juice. You know, grapefruit juice, in fact, is, is wonderful, right? Uh, and in the, in the West, in fact, you know, people drink that, right? Uh, but if you're actually taking statins, it's actually bad news, right? Because you're going to affect the metabolism of statins, right? So, you know, here is, in fact, an interaction that you see uh, between uh, sort of a, a, a food product, a food agent, and, of course, a pharmaceutical. So, you know, those things, in fact, have to be taken into account, right? When you're looking at the benefits. Two points. One, in fact, is prevention. And uh, that's fine, you know, in terms of uh, a lot of these natural products, prevention, you know, you, you don't have the issues, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the concerns that I sort of mentioned. And I think uh, uh, diet, uh, exercise, and of course, these this agents, in fact, as preventatives is actually a, a sort of where we need to move forward. But when you just start looking at therapeutics, then, of course, you need to be careful uh, because uh, a diet, uh, sort of what is actually good at prevention may not cause regression of, 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 of atherosclerotic plaques in individuals who already got uh, atherosclerosis. And also you need to look at the interaction of your, of your herbal remedy or whatever natural product with the pharmaceuticals that the individuals are, are taking. And so for that, I think two critical requirements. One is actually large clinical trials. That's the problem with natural products because there's not much money, in fact, uh, as far as big farmers are, are concerned. Uh, and reduce it is one example which, which actually went along and showed those mixed fluctuation in sort of results which we're getting from small clinical trials in, in more uh, sort of single population when they took everything in account and realized, well, we needed a much higher dose of omega-3 fatty acid 
and they developed an a methyl ester, which was then actually tried in an extremely large trial of 4,000 individuals, right? Uh, and that actually sort of uh, uh, showed that, yes, in certain individuals who are actually on certain pharmaceuticals, yes, this is actually a, a sort of a, a, a viable option. Okay. So I think there is a lot of studies coming out on, on herbs and natural products, uh, uh, working on cell culture model systems, uh, uh, and sort of coming out with the target, that, well, this is going to be effective, maybe in fact on the sort of wild type mice. I think you need to actually expand that, you need to understand it in more detail, you need to actually sort of then eventually carry out large clinical trials, uh, uh, and then actually see what, what, what the outcome may be. Uh, which of course is a lot of money, but you can also look at certain themes in diet, right? So a lot of uh, early studies, in fact, on diet, Mediterranean diet, uh, Japanese diet, where actually sort of more survey based. And so you can actually glean a lot uh, from, from those type of studies as well. So it's actually no simple answer to that, that question, right? It's that we need to understand it in, in more detail, right? sort of things which we need to carry out, but we need to also be cautious by sort of saying, oh, well, look, this actually uh, saw some success, go along and take that, right? Because if you're actually on, on, on pharmaceuticals, uh, then uh, you, you may actually have interactions. Another point to bear in mind is that this is a dynamic process. So you, can, you should not actually extrapolate even in clinical trials too much back, uh, say 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, you only had a small proportion of world population on statins. Now you've got a much larger population which is on statins. And they've got much more stabilized plaques compared to what they were 10, 10 years ago. If you find something which was successful in clinical trials 10 years ago may no longer be the case now because, in fact, studies have stabilized their plaques. So you have to be careful about in terms of when the studies are carried out as well. But uh, in the sort of short, more studies, more larger clinical trials and not, uh, uh, not in fact, uh, uh, on sort of a smaller scale, in fact. You know, I mean, I've sort of come across and talked with... Uh, with uh, you know, sort of various visits that in India, in fact, 20 uh, sort of individuals have been taken uh, and uh, sort of uh, product, in fact, uh, sort of mentioned that this is actually sort of effective. And that's actually sort of okay, in fact, in terms of sort of convincing, in fact, uh, a population which is perhaps not, uh, well, of course, the, the education is increasing, but I think you need to actually sort of, have sort of more robust uh, peer reviewed large trials, which of course needs a lot of money. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, detailed answer. And uh, I have a next question regarding your uh, DGLA study. Uh, yeah. In your DGLA study, did you conduct long-term studies or the effect is for short-term short -term only? Uh, okay. So DGLA studies, in fact, uh, we have done short-term studies, but the, the studies that I described, right, in, in was actually... Uh, one by our collaborator, which was actually on a mouse model of atherosclerosis, the protein E deficient mouse model. That was actually a long-term study. Uh, and uh, there's also, in fact, studies which we have carried out, which are actually long-term studies as well. So this is actually sort of talking about uh, 12 to 24 weeks of, of high-fat diet. Thank you very much, sir. And he, during your uh, presentation, you have also mentioned regarding the microbiome and atherosclerosis. Uh, uh, can you please elaborate on microbiome and its uh, relation in uh, immunity? Okay, I mean, that's really a, a, a sort of a, not a simple uh, sort of question to sort of to, 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 to address because it's, it's extremely complex and we're actually sort of learning a huge amount, right, uh, about changes in, in, in microbiome, right, uh, from changes in our diet and uh, uh, changes, in fact, that, uh, that actually sort of uh, uh, occur in various, various diseases. And if I just sort of uh, go along, and uh, one of the things, in fact, which uh, just try to sort of, uh, maybe in fact, this is the only way I can sort of perhaps go back. Oh, yeah, okay. So if you go on this particular slide, the uh, this slide is just actually looking at microbiome uh, in relation to atherosclerosis and how, in fact, it affects uh, in, in immune system and inflammatory responses. 
just associated with this disease, right? And so this is just one example. And, uh, I, I recommend that you read this article if you want to have more detail. So here, in fact, is uh, the number of effects which which with the uh, the, the microbiome may have. Uh, if, for example, if you got uh, a high fat diet, it will cause uh, leakiness of the gut, uh, which will of course uh, imply uh, that uh, uh, the 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 LPS will then actually move uh, from the the gut into the plasma. Uh, that will actually cause increase in, in pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling uh, and so on. Uh, also, nitric oxide mediated vasodilation. Of course, the arrows in this case are going down because I'm showing the actions of probiotic. But if probiotics were not present, clearly one example would be leakiness of the gut, which would cause lipopolysaccharide to leak out, uh, causing increase in, in uh, told re like receptor 4 signaling, causing increased production of a pro inflammatory cytokines. It would also, in fact, uh, cause uh, changes, in fact, in, in vasodilation. You also, in fact, have a, a increased production, as I mentioned in the previous slide, of a, a, a TMAO. Uh, so if you go to high uh, diet, which is rich in red meat, uh, the gut microbiota will produce TMA, which will be converted into TMAO by the, uh, the liver. And then this TMAO will also go on, in fact, and uh, increase vascular inflammation, which, of course, then is reduced by probiotics. So it shows you, in fact, that there are actually multiple mechanisms. And here, in fact, I've just actually mentioned two potential mechanisms. One is, in fact, a leakiness of the gut by detrimental uh, microbiome, which will cause uh, pro-inflammatory agents, such as lipopolysaccharide, to move into the plasma and then affect immune cells, but also metabolites of the bacteria under dietary setting. So in this case, you've got uh, 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 sort of the uh, L-carnitine converted, in fact, eventually into TMAO, which then also, in fact, that has a direct effect on uh, cells in the vasculature and also immune cells. So, you know, there are actually sort of no single mechanism, there are multiple mechanisms. I'm just illustrating two here, in fact, in relation to atherosclerosis. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I have a next question, uh, like uh, with your experience in the field of cardiovascular disease disorders, would it be possible to explain the relationship between xanthelasma, uh, pulper, pulperbum, and cardiovascular disorders? Yeah, so one of the point which is worth bearing in mind is this thing about comorbidities. Right, in the sense that, you know, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, you know, obviously changes happening in the arteries and the clinical complications, of course, uh, will, which will, will, will are associated with the arteries, so plaque rupturing uh, and then blocking the artery uh, is obviously one aspect that we're looking at. There's, of course, inflammation associated with a lot of other sites which eventually feeds in either by changing the risk factors associated with uh, uh, cardiovascular disease or the immune cell profile uh, in either the plasma or the arteries or, of course, in the bone marrow uh, and then impacting atherosclerosis. So uh, to give you sort of some examples, if you go back to my, my earlier uh, sort of point about the SIRT trial, which I mentioned, which was not successful. That was high incidence of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease in, in individuals with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and so where low-dose methotrexate was successful and therefore used, in fact, in individuals in cardiovascular disease. So that's one link, an inflammatory disorder, which is actually uh, the uh, 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 arthritis predisposing to atherosclerosis. You take any inflammatory disorder, uh, you're going to have a uh, sort of increased cardiovascular uh, morbidity and, and mortality. Uh, you know, inflammatory disorders, in fact, in the intestine, inflammatory disorder in the skin. So that's one thing. Inflammation, uh, adipose tissue inflammation affecting uh, cardiovascular disease. So psoriasis, uh, inflammation of the skin. There's, there's a lot of evidence, in fact, and we try to get some, some, some sort of uh, 
uh, studies actually carried out here by an expert, in fact, who was with psoriasis, to try and link with, 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 with cardiovascular disease. So that's inflammation, any inflammatory disorder uh, leading to cardiovascular disease, and then metabolic perturbations, right? So changes, in fact, in levels of, of, of cholesterol uh, metabolism, fatty acid metabolism, uh, glucose homeostasis, insulin resistance, they all eventually impact cardiovascular complications. So any agent, any sort of disorder associated with uh, changes in immune and inflammatory responses and metabolic perturbations will actually impact cardiovascular disease. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, this is all uh, regarding the questions from audience. And uh, now I'll, I would like to dis uh, request our panel members, if you have any doubts, you are free to answer the question. Yeah, sure. Doctor, can you come in? I'm here. Am I? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Ramji. It was wonderful. It's extraordinary in its depth and its breadth. In fact, by the last slide, it was so overwhelming. Uh, too Thank much, you. Uh, too Thank much you. information in such a little time. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, intriguing. I had tons of questions, but when you meet in person, maybe I'll ask you instead of holding off everybody else. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Atrimed. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Damleji. And thank you, all the panel members and Ayurvedic Association members, too. And thanks, all the participants. This uh, will be available on YouTube uh, later. And you're all welcome to watch it, those who missed it. And uh, you should all join us for our next lecture. We'll announce it pretty soon. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, anything else, Dr. Damleji? Yeah, uh, there could be more questions from panelists, so we will let the panelists ask questions. Okay, sure. Dr. Manoj Sadat? Well, let me ask one question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, please, sir. Please, go ahead. Any more questions? Dr. Saiju? Dr. Shiban, you can ask the question. I only one question out of my 200 questions. I'll ask only one question. Is atherosclerosis an inflammatory disease or just a mere cholesterol metabolic disease? Can you repeat that again? I didn't catch it. Is atherosclerosis an inflammatory disease or a metabolic disease where cholesterol is yeah. hyped up a bit too much? There, there is no doubt or the evidence, accumulating evidence in the large last 15 years that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disorder. And in fact, uh, when it comes to undergraduate teaching, in fact, I give them a lecture, in fact, and uh, about uh, you know the evidence which actually sort of goes along to show that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disorder. So I think when in the sort of uh, Brown and Goldstein, when they discovered the LDL receptor, uh, they sort of felt that, well, it's actually uh, cholesterol is the culprit. Uh, but we now know, in fact, that cholesterol and all the sort of perturbation, dysfunction in, in lipid homeostasis that you see, ultimately act through uh, inflammation and inflammatory cytokines. So cholesterol crystals, for example, activate inflamm inflammasome. So although, in fact, the triggers, the risk factors, in fact, are, are sort of uh, are, are lipids and then sort of uh, uh, hypertension and glucose and so on, the ultimate action is that the uh, so modulation of inflammation. So the, the, the evidence, in fact, is, is so strong. And then I think the, the final evidence, which I, was the Cantos trial, you know, which was the... Uh, large uh, trial with 8,000 uh, individuals. And that actually sort of went along and showed that all of those years of evidence which we had from animal models and looking at inflammatory cells in plaques in humans, where we can now, in fact, target as a, a key cytokine and actually lower, in fact, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. So, you know, that is actually sort of, I think, the ultimate sort of uh, 
final uh, proof, in fact, on, on atherosclerosis being an inflammatory disorder. But of course, that inflammation is triggered by a lot of agents, and of course, dysfunctional lipid homeostasis is one of them. Thank you. Anything else, Dr. Damraji? Uh, I think uh, no, no more questions. Uh, I again uh, personally want to thank uh, yeah. Dr. Ramji. It was an ex excellent lecture. Uh, you know, the, no wonder it is from a pro professor. Uh, I have a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go on. <clears throat> yeah. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So whether on. you have worked in any of the plant uh, molecules in atherosclerosis, have you found any? Uh, have you done any work on yeah. plant molecules in this? Yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah, yeah. So you know, I mentioned, in fact, you know, this is a study, in fact, uh, of of uh, uh, the uh, well, probiotic. Of course, this is a more coming from bacteria, but DGLA, of course. Uh, is derived from GLA, when GLA is found from evening primrose oil and, and borage oil. So that's actually one uh, uh, sort of molecule of, of plant origin. Uh, then we've got uh, uh, resveratrol, is another agent that we're studying, which is actually found in grapes of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the skin of the grapes, uh, uh, putting collagen from a granite, you know, so a lot of different sort of plant uh, uh, agents that, that we're sort of studying, in fact, and trying to get more deeper mechanistic insight. The majority of this uh, uh, sort of agents tend to be of plant origin in, in, in any case, right? And uh, that's why I sort of feel, in fact, that the Ayurveda, right, uh, uh, has got a lot of potential, right? Uh, uh, it just needs a, a lot of funding, I think, from the Indian government, in fact, and more large trials, uh, uh, and more, more mechanistic insight. But, you know, the majority of these uh, successes have been sort of mainly from initially, in fact, from plant, plant origin. Hope that that answers that question. The other yeah, point I had to bear in mind, of course, because of the the, the recording. In fact, uh, obviously, uh, I I can't present all the, the unpublished uh, uh, data. In fact, uh, you know, to sort of protect people who've done the work, because obviously, publication takes takes quite a substantial time. In fact, from writing. So, if they actually wants to talk in this more detail, right? Now, just just contact me, and I'm. I'm sort of more than happy to spend hours uh, uh, to sort of, you know, engage in, in, in scientific discussion, right? And uh, as I say, in fact, that uh, to me, it was uh, uh, great to actually sort of meet Rishikesh and, and, and Lata Ben, in fact, uh, in, in Bangalore. I mean, not only we had scientific exchange, which led to this, but uh, also, as I mentioned, something about my, my community service, in fact, uh, and one of the things was Samu Pratna, where in fact Lata in fact uh, sang two bhajans, and uh, you know the audience well, wow, you know, so clearly in fact uh, there is you know it's actually just goes beyond in fact you know our scientific discussion in fact goes in so it goes to our our deep culture and, and heritage right and uh, so you know it's, it's been sort of a, a a good thing in fact wonderful thing to to have met uh, both of you in fact and uh, I'll be happy to in fact uh, uh, you know be involved in and in further sort of uh, presentation in the future. Not only with the Atrimed, but any other sort of organizations um, discussing science, and that's so good, right? Along with our our culture and heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, uh, thank you all for your gracious presence and I request all the participants uh, to submit your valuable feedback on a given link on uh, the screen. Uh, please uh, do submit the feedback and get your certificates within 24 hours after the submission of your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone. I, I have an announcement. Uh, the next lecture will be how to find toxicity of food and drugs. That's by Dr. Subramanian Mangala. On 19th, no, sir? Yeah, yeah next meeting. Yeah. Okay. He's, he's from Bangalore as well, right? I met him in yeah, Bangalore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you also, it, you had uh, Siv Balak, Balak, Balashankar, in fact, who gave us uh, just a talk, in fact, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, he's right. also in Bangalore, in fact, yeah. he's been in Cardiff. And I actually met both of them in Bangalore. So that's, uh, 
to Bangalore because I see the place. In fact, to meet uh, uh, sort of scientists, I suspect, uh, and and sort of have sort of connections as well. Yeah, Shiva Balasubramanian was talking to. You, I mean, talking about you when 